This week, German news magazine Stern published extracts from the recently discovered private diaries of Adolf Hitler. They'd been authenticated by historian Hugh Trevor Roper, and their sister papers The Sunday Times and Newsweek announced that they would also be printing translated versions. Other historians, though, expressed reservations about the authenticity of the diaries, and the resulting scandal when it turned out that they were indeed faked cost the editors of Stern and the Sunday Times their jobs and left the reputation of Stern and Trevor Roper in tatters. It was a good week for Scottish football as Aberdeen, managed by Alex Ferguson, pulled off a surprise win against Real Madrid to win the European Cup Winners' Cup and become only the third Scottish club after Celtic and Rangers to win European silverware. A couple of days later, Dundee United became Scottish champions for the first and so far only time, securing the title with an away win in the derby game with Dundee FC. Perennial British TV music show Top of the Pops aired its 1000th episode, featuring a mix of contemporary music and archive footage from the show's past. And on the 9th of May, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher called a general election to take place on the 9th of June. Despite the economic woes besetting Britain, the Conservatives were expected to win easily as the Labour Party was mired in division between centrist and left-wing factions, with the new SDP Liberal Alliance also threatening to split their traditional vote. For the first time since 1980, the Formula One circus arrived in Monaco without having had a tragic death at the previous race, so there was much more of a cheerful atmosphere in the Principality, though of course there were the usual problems of teams working in cramped conditions. As usual, things were a bit different in Monaco, with no high-pressure refuelling allowed, so refuelling stops during the race were out. Qualifying sessions on Thursday and Saturday and no driving on Friday, and only 20 cars on the grid and 26 in qualifying, so it was early on Tuesday morning that those teams who hadn't registered a point in 1982, Tolman, March and Theodore, had to turn out for pre-qualifying to whittle the five cars down to three. As it turned out, both Theodores broke down after setting only initial times, so Salazar, Giacomelli and Warwick went through, though the Tolman boys could count themselves lucky after having all sorts of technical gremlins of their own. Meanwhile, the other teams were preparing for qualifying proper. Tyrrell now had the updated Ford DFY engines joining Williams, McLaren and Lotus, but was still some 200 horsepower down on the Turbo Boys. There was a lot of discussion about how the new breed of non-ground effect cars would go on the tight street circuit, and there was a certain amount of guesswork going on behind the scenes with regards to setup. Arrows, meanwhile, were looking very fetching in their new livery, the cream and burgundy of tobacco brand Barclay, Mark Sierra's personal sponsors, who'd been persuaded to front up a little bit more for the prestigious race. Thursday's session was a bit exploratory, and then on Saturday it rained heavily so no one could improve their times. Alain Prost took pole then, with Arnu alongside then their respective teammates Chiva and Tombe. Keke Rosberg was a very respectable fifth, albeit almost 1.5 seconds off the top, with PK alongside, and De Cesaris, Lafitte, Charrier and Warwick making up a slightly less turbo-heavy top ten than usual. Elio De Angelis, by contrast, in the Turbo Lotus would start from the back row in 19th, alongside Monaco newbie Danny Sullivan. But the real shock was that neither McLaren qualified. Both Lauda and Watson had had various problems on Thursday. Ron Dennis blamed the Michelin tyres, but fellow Cosworth and Michelin runners Ligier were well up. And when the rain fell on Saturday, it meant that, for the first time in his long career, Nicky Lauda would register a DNQ against his name. Watson's only previous DNQ, by the way, was also at Monaco in 1980, again for McLaren. Sunday dawned wet again, and although the rain wasn't heavy, it was persistent. It drizzled all the way through the support races, dried up a bit, then rained again just before the F1 warm-up, and by the time the pit lane opened for the main event, it was spitting and damp and teams were left with a dilemma as to tyres and setup. Most decided to start on wets, but with dry weather setups, so if the track dried sufficiently, they could swap tyres and be fast. But Keke Rosberg decided to take a gamble and started on slicks, as did some of the other drivers with little to lose from getting it wrong, Warwick, both Tyrrells and Sierra for instance. By the start, the tree-shaded right-hand side of the grid where Prost would start was almost dry, while the exposed left-hand side was still damp, so it would be an interesting start to say the least. When it came, Prost got away well, but Arnu spun his wheels and was slow away, and by contrast Rosberg fairly sprinted off the line, shooting past Arnu, Tombe and Chiva to go second, with Chiva, Tombe, De Cesaris, Arnu, Lafitte and Jarier following. Arnu got a place back before the end of the lap, while Mansell and Alboreto tangled in the midfield and ended up both retiring. Off camera, Rosberg dived through as the leaders came round to finish the lap to take the lead. 
Chiva, meanwhile, was clearly holding up the Ferraris. Arnu was now ahead of Tombe. René had a go at the start of lap two and got past, but overcooked it and ran wide at saint devot staying on the road but allowing Eddie back through. So the Chiva train now consisted of the two Ferraris, De Cesaris, Lafitte, Jarier and Piquet, and the last of these decided that with a dry line already visible on the track by lap four, it was worth switching to dry tyres. It was clearly the way to go, with the dry shod Rosberg already pulling out a big lead over Prost, but the stop dropped Piquet to 15th with a lot of work to do. By now, Arnoux and Lafitte had both made their way past Cheever and were running together in pursuit of Prost, with the Williams all over the back of the Ferrari, until there was contact on lap 6, sending Arnoux hobbling back to the pits for a new nose and left rear tyre. But his suspension gave way on the way round, and he was pushed back to the pits by the marshals. The Ferrari team repaired what they could and sent him back out, but it didn't last long. While all this was happening, there was a further flurry of stops for slicks, with Prost the most notable of the front runners. while Tombe was losing time, unable to stop while our news car was being worked on. All of which meant that by the end of lap 7 of 76, Rosberg led teammate Lafitte by 28.5 seconds, with Tombe another 23 seconds or so back in third, with Chiva, Sura and Warwick hot on his heels and Rosberg was among the backmarkers already. Tombe and Cheever finally came in shortly afterwards, promoting Sura to the dizzy heights of third, with Warwick still running well behind, now the top turbo car, but with Prost and Piquet right on his gearbox. Warwick was busy proving that last year's good run at Brands Hatch had been no fluke, and giving fuel to the perennial rumours that he would be snapped up by a big-name team soon, keeping Prost behind him without too much trouble. It helped, of course, that Prost's car had been set up for the wet, while Piquet was running on very low boost to eke out his fuel for the whole race, but still, it would not hurt Warwick's confidence at all. Piquet got a slingshot past Prost in the tunnel, while Cheever had caught up to the group too, but Nelson didn't see him any more able to make an impression on Warwick than Prost had been. With the race at about one-third distance, the two Williams drivers looked pretty secure up front, with only an accident or a breakdown threatening a 1-2 finish. On lap 31, Cheever's engine gave way and he parked it next to the harbour, and a couple of laps later, Jarier was out when his hydraulics broke. Otherwise, though, there wasn't much of interest to watch on track, with Warwick and Piquet slowly reeling in third-place Sura, and Tombe putting in a series of fastest laps from too far back to make much difference. As half-distance came and went, the Warwick-Piquet scrap caught up to Sura, and on lap 49, as the Swiss driver shaped up to lap Sullivan, Warwick had a go, got squeezed over, and the pair collided, nerfing Sura into the barriers, allowing PK to tiptoe between them and take third. Sura was out on the spot, and Warwick limped round with broken suspension to retire. A sad end to a great drive by both men. So the top six now had a more familiar look to it, with PK, Prosp, Trazy and Tombe in third to sixth places, and they all moved up again four laps later, when Lafitte's Williams rolled to a stop in the pits with a broken gearbox. In the closing stages, last year's winner Patrese put his foot down and took the fastest lap from Tombe, only to blister his tyres and have to come in for new ones, then dropped out with a fuel system malfunction anyway. PK also had a charge to see if he could make an impact on Rosberg and got the fastest lap, but couldn't do much about Rosberg's lead and settled back to finish second. And that he did. Rosberg took an excellent win ahead of Nelson PK with Prost third, Tombe took fourth and was the last man on the lead lap, with Danny Sullivan and Mauro Baldi picking up the last points, two laps behind, and Chico Serra the only man to finish the race and not score. So with Piquet drawing ahead of Prost in the title race, the team prepared to head for Belgium and a new track, well, a new version of a classic, in the shape of Spa-Francorchamps. <laughs>